Thank you for tuning in today at Propel Church. Whether you're watching through YouTube or listening through a podcast, we want to say thank you. Our hope at Propel is that you would be propelled into an authentic relationship with Jesus. From wherever you are tuning in, we hope that you are encouraged and inspired by this week's message. We're kicking off a brand new series today called Bah Humbug. And if you're familiar, this expression comes from the character in a Charles Dickens novel named Scrooge. Now, for some of us, Christmas is a really, really exciting time of year. For some of you, for, from August on, you've been playing Christmas music, right? And if you're those people, you may not need this series today. You don't need to reclaim joy. We need to help you tone it down, because, right... <laughs> Christmas music doesn't need to start until a certain time of the year, and that's not before Thanksgiving. And so um, we're just, no, but, but really for some of you, Christmas is not that exciting of a time. In fact, for some people, when we get into the Christmas season, it's a really hard season because maybe you've lost a loved one. And so you're kind of entering into these holidays with some anxiousness or some anxiety, some pain and some frustration. For others of you, Christmas is a difficult time of year because you know that there's going to be some tough conversations that happen. You know that maybe it's the busyness of the season where you're just going to run a hundred miles an hour, or maybe uh, you know that there's a family member that you're going to come into contact with that's just going to make some off the wall statements. Like you know they're coming because grandma ain't got no filter, right? <laughs> Or maybe you got that crazy family member that you're wondering, why do we still invite them to dinners, you know? And if you can't figure out who the crazy family member is, it's because it's you. (laughs) And so, I mean, that's just the tough reality. Maybe you know there's going to be some tension around the table this Christmas season. So you've gotten some anxiety. And when you think about the Christmas season, you really become a lot like Scrooge. And Scrooge is a character that... Charles Dickens describes as a man who is cold and hard-hearted. He's stingy and really bitter towards other people. And if you're in that position as we come into this Christmas season, my hope for you is that you're going to be able to reclaim the joys of these holidays. And I want to help you do that as we open God's Word together. But before we dive into God's Word, I want us to look at the original Scrooge, and he's a guy by the name of Jonah. Now, if you don't know the story of Jonah at all, Jonah is a guy. In Jonah chapter 1 of the Bible, we see that Jonah hears from the Lord that he's supposed to go to Nineveh to preach that they should repent and turn from their sin. And if they repent and turn from their sin, God will spare their lives. But Jonah doesn't feel like the people of Nineveh deserve to be saved, and he runs from God's call. In fact, he goes the complete opposite direction. God said, go to Nineveh. He turns and goes the other way. I know you guys have never done that and you've never struggled with anything like that, but this is Jonah's story. And so as Jonah is fleeing to Tarshish, he gets into a boat and he goes out to run away from God. But in the middle of the ocean or the middle of the lake, there's a storm And this storm begins to rock the boat, and the people in the boat are having a conversation about whose fault it is, and Jonah finally pipes up and he says, it's my fault. So they decide to throw Jonah overboard. So they take Jonah and they toss him into the sea, and Jonah would have died in the middle of that sea because, well, he's probably just not that great of a swimmer. If you've ever been thrown into the water in the middle of the lake or the middle of the sea, your chances are really slim. But Jonah chapter 1 verse 17 gives us one of the most powerful depictions of what grace looks like. And it says that the Lord arranged for a fish to swallow Jonah. See, what Jonah deserved because of his disobedience was to die in the middle of the sea. But the Lord through his grace arranged for a fish to swallow Jonah. Sometimes grace shows up in a really mysterious way. And the whole purpose of grace in our life is to preserve us for the purpose of repentance. And so it's in the belly of the fish that Jonah chapter two comes into play and Jonah repents of running from God. 
After he repents from running from God, the fish spits Jonah up onto the shore, and he decides, I should probably follow God. (laughs) After he gets out of the belly of the fish, he then chooses to go to Nineveh, but he still does it kind of begrudgingly. In fact, he kind of slowly makes his way through the town, and then when he gets up to preach to the people of Nineveh, the only thing he says is an eight-word sermon. But after those eight words, the people of Nineveh repent. They turn from their ways. And rather than celebrating in this moment, Jonah's actually angry. Jonah chapter 4 verse 1 says this. says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. What seemed wrong? It seemed wrong that the Lord would save Nineveh. And so he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said? Lord, when I was still at home, that is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were so gracious and compassionate. Right, this sounds so, God is so terrible, right? He's all gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. So Lord, take my life away, for it's better for me to die than to live. Come on, how many of you got an overdramatic friend, right? Like, you know, you're like, man, this is how they live. But then here's what the Lord's response is to Jonah. But the Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? What Jonah is doing is he's looking at the people of Tarshish, or he's looking at the people of Nineveh, and he's saying, God, they're getting what they don't deserve, I don't feel like those people deserve your grace. I don't feel like those people deserve your mercy, forgetting that Jonah himself deserved to die, but God chose to show him grace and mercy. If you want to know the whole story of Jonah, it's that sometimes the people who are forgiven get mad at the forgiveness of God, and that should not be the case. And what Jonah does is he shows us what it looks like to be used by God in a powerful way, but still have a hard heart. And so what I want to help you and I do is get rid of a hard heart and instead experience the joys of Christmas. And so how do we do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Here's the first thing, is repent of our hard hearts. Now, repentance gets a really bad rap. Because when most people think of repentance, what you think of is that hillbilly guy with the bullhorn and the sign that stood at the corner of Walmart. And he just shouted, repent, you know, as he was doing, his teeth were falling out. You know, like, I mean, that was kind of, that's the depiction. It was the turn before you burn guy. And when we think of repentance, we think of this incredibly negative word. But repentance is one of the most life-giving words in all of scripture, because it's a beautiful opportunity for you and I to turn directions. That's what repentance is. It's to have a change in direction, to have a change of mind. So what repentance looks like is I'm heading this direction and I'm realizing that this is not the plan that God has for my life. This is not what God designed me for. It's not what he made me for. So to repent is to turn away from sin and to turn toward God. It's to leave the past behind and to walk into all that God has for us. If you want a good depiction of that, go to Luke chapter 15. Repentance is not just turning from your sin or leaving the pig trough. It's returning back to God's house. It's coming home. It's returning. And so when we look at repentance, what I don't want you to think is that I'm asking you to repent for the things that have been done to you. Because there have been things that some of you have experienced that were not your fault. You don't need to repent of those things. Here's what you need to repent of. You need to repent of taking justice into your own hands. We're not talking about repenting for the things that were done to us, but what most of us need to repent of when it comes to having a hard heart is the responses that we had to those situations. Because when something happened to us, we made statements like, I'll never let people hurt me like that again. You ever been there? Oh, you know what? They wronged me. I'll never let people get that close. And what you thought was actually protecting you from harm 
is actually the very thing that kept you from healing. Because God never designed you to live with barriers. Now, there's a difference between boundaries and barriers. I think you need boundaries. Boundaries are healthy. Come on, some of y'all need really healthy boundaries. You got, uh, you got in-laws, and you know, you know what I'm saying? I got great in-laws. God has blessed me tremendously. Come on, they in the audience, and they, they're like, yes, amen, you know? Got great in-laws. But here's how you know the difference between a boundary and a barrier. A boundary is designed to protect and cultivate the calling that God has given you. A barrier is designed to keep people out. There's a difference. Because what happens is if you put up a barrier, the enemy will convince you it's a boundary, but it's kept you from relationships. That's not God's design. God designed you to have boundaries to protect the calling he has on your life, but he didn't design you to live with walls to where you were a fortified city that kept people at arm's length. So when we repent of our hard hearts, this is what uh, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13 says. It says, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. It's not an they might not prosper or they might struggle or they might not. It is a definite they will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them, which are the transgressions, will obtain mercy. Blessed is the one who fears the Lord always, but whoever hardens his heart will fall into calamity. If you want to know why you've got so much chaos going on around you, it's probably because you've hardened your heart in some areas and it's causing chaos that you never knew it could. God designed you to not have a hard heart, but to live to where you feel, to where you, you know what? You should hurt sometimes. I've been pastoring a church now for, uh, this one for six, over six years and been in ministry for 10 years now, a decade. It's been crazy. But I'll tell you, there have been a lot of times where we've been hurt by people. Because when you pastor people, you pastor sheep at a close proximity. You do life with people. You love people. You bleed with people. You hurt with people. And then sometimes they get mad at you and then they just disappear. People talk now. I knew what ghosting was before ghosting was a thing. You be, if you're in ministry, you'll text me and be like, hey, how, how are you and the family doing? You never hear from them. And then here's the problem with a small town. You see them everywhere. You run into them at Food Line and they do one of these. You know? You get hurt by people. And here's what I used to think. I used to think I just needed tough skin. But the problem with developing tough skin is over time, tough skin becomes a hard heart. You don't need tough skin. You need a tough source. You need a God who's bigger than hurt. You need a God who's bigger than pain. You need a God who is your strength that you can lean on, trust in, and rely on in those hard times. Whoever conceals their transgressions will not prosper. But if you'll get them out, if you'll reveal it, God will heal it. And it happens like that every single time. So three areas that we primarily conceal. Number one are sin issues. You've been hiding sin. And here's the crazy part. Everything you're trying to hide from God, he already knows about it because he's all-knowing. You've never sinned, and God was like, I ain't never seen that one before, you know? He's not shocked. He knows what you look at on your phone. He knows what you do. He knew you flipped that person off yesterday near Concord Mills. I mean, God knows. Come on, two places that you're going to need the Holy Spirit, Walmart and Concord Mills. Like, you're going (laughs) to... This is how it is. God knows. He knows all those things. And so what happens is, is the enemy convinces us that God won't love us if he knew what we've done. But the whole beauty of the gospel is that while we were still sinning and transgressing and had faults and flaws, God would send Jesus to die in our place. He knew you were jacked up and he chose to pursue you anyways. That's the goodness of our God. Don't hide sin from him. Bring it out into the light because the moment you hide sin from God, it will rob you of the intimacy of a relationship with him. The other thing that we do is we conceal issues that we have with God. 
Some of you have been avoiding your relationship with God because you're angry with him. And the reason why you're angry with him is because he didn't do what you thought he was going to do when you thought he was going to do it. So you've been praying for or believing for something. Maybe you asked for or you prayed for that promotion in the job and then you didn't get it. And then you look back and you're like, well, before that happened, before God didn't come through for me like I wanted him to, we used to spend a lot more time together. What happened? Well, you were concealing transgressions. You have beef with God. You just didn't think he was big enough to handle it. God can handle your anger. He can handle your frustration and he can handle your disappointment. So run to him. And in the third area, and I got to keep running. I haven't even made it to point two yet. Is it, is uh, concealed issues with others, concealed issues with others. You've got problems with people. It may have been a, a family member that said something like four Christmases ago. And every time you see them, those thoughts come back up. It may not be a family member. It may be a coworker or a person who hurt you earlier on in your life. And now here's how you know you have an issue with unforgiveness is when you see that person and immediately you begin to get angry and frustrated. Like something wells up within you. Here's what that is. That's the Holy Spirit in you going, you've got something you need to deal with. Stop ignoring it. If you conceal your issues, you will not prosper. But if you'll get it out, if you'll get it out into the open, you will be blessed beyond all imagination. God will heal your heart and do things in your life that you never thought were possible. Let me tell you, you need to forgive some of your family in this Christmas season. Because the only person who's suffering is you. You've been holding on to bitterness, anger, and frustration, and they don't even know you're mad. So you think you're punishing them. Oh, I'll show them. I'm going to quit talking to them. They just think you're moody. They don't know you got problems with them. But get it out in the open. Because the longer you let the enemy rob you of unity, the harder your heart will become. Deal with your issues. This is what God has to say. It's the prayer that I'm praying over you is Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. It says, and I'll give you a new heart. I'll put in you a new spirit. And I will remove that heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. What God wants to do is he wants to give you a new heart. Sometimes we think that what God wants to do is he wants to come in and just chip away that, the heart of stone that you have, the, that heart. He doesn't. He just wants to replace it. And it happens through prayer. It happens through allowing God in. It happens through getting real and honest and vulnerable. And I'm going to lead you through a prayer at the end of this message to help you with that. Here's the second thing. We need to remember the reason for the celebration. My wife um, sends me to the grocery store sometimes, and uh, I'm just not good at it. I'm going to be honest, because I am overly confident in my shopping abilities. And so she'll send me to the grocery store, and she gives me a list before I go. Um, But because I'm overly confident, I don't need her list. I got it up here, right? I've remembered it. So I confidently grab my buggy and I go into food line. Well, about the time I hit aisle two, I don't remember why I'm at, 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 you know, food line at all. And so what I do is I kind of zigzag through every aisle, hoping that my memory is going to jog, like, and I'm going to remember those things I was supposed to grab. I'm going to remember my why, and then I'm going to get home. And not only am I going to have the entire list that my wife wanted, I have brought a bounty of goodies and, uh, and we can celebrate how amazing I am. And, uh, and so I check out and I go home and we start unpacking this grocery list and, well, I don't have all the items. <laughs> and what happens is I forget my why and when I forget my why, I'm unable to fulfill the whole reason why I do this in the first place. The whole reason why I went to the store was because there was a specific reason that I needed to go to the store. I love what Andy Stanley says. He says, if you don't have a target, you'll miss every time. And if we don't understand the why behind the Christmas season, we will never celebrate it in its intended purpose. 
The reason why we celebrate Christmas is not the accumulation of stuff. It's not a tree. It's a person. And his name is Jesus Christ. And so Galatians chapter four says it this way, why we celebrate Christmas. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. What is that law? It's the Mosaic law, the 12 commandments. In other words, what we celebrate at Christmas is the fact that you and I were in bondage to live up to the standard of living out those 10 commandments. And in the event, we couldn't live up to those 10 commandments. If we couldn't fulfill all 12 of them, then we were going to spend eternity separated from God. So what does God do? He loves us enough to come and take flesh to redeem us who were held captive to the law. Because the whole purpose of the law is not that you memorize it, but that you realize you can't live up to that and you desperately need a savior. So he wants to redeem those under the law for what purpose? That we might receive adoption to sonship. In other words, he came so that you could become part of his family. The whole reason why Jesus shows up is so that he could redeem you and then place you in a family. And can I tell you something? It's the family you've always desired within. It's the thing you felt like you were missing your entire life. To be placed in a community, people who love you and care about you and are there for you, that's God's design and purpose. The thing that we celebrate this Christmas is that we serve a God who is Emmanuel, God with us, meaning that we are never alone. When we celebrate Christmas, we recognize the fact that we serve a God who has perfect timing because when the set time had fully come, God sent his son. It was at just the right time. And if God sends Jesus into the world at just the right time, he knows exactly what you'll need, you need, when you need it, and he'll show up for you every single day time. When we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate the fact that we serve a miracle working, gracious God who saw darkness in the world and chooses to bring light into it. When we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate the fact that people who are in bondage and captivity can be set free through the power of Jesus Christ. When we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate the fact that sons and daughters who have ran away now have the opportunity to to come home. This is the good news of Christmas. Can I get a good amen? Amen. That's why we celebrate. It's not about presents. It's about the greatest gift that God would ever give us. And his name is Jesus. It is the name that is above every other name. And if we miss out on the meaning of Christmas, we will never experience the blessing God has for us in this season. Christmas is not about stuff. It's not about accumulating more. I'm not saying presents are bad. But can I tell you, the Christmas season is typically when we spend money we don't have to impress people we really don't like. If that's what we do, we've missed it. The whole reason why we celebrate is because Jesus came. And he came for you and he came for me in the middle of our brokenness for the purpose of relationship. That we might be adopted as sons and daughters of a king. So as you're going about this Christmas season and you're looking to reclaim the joy, remember the reason why we celebrate is that Jesus came, that Jesus lived, that Jesus died so that we might live in him. And here's the third thing recognize the opportunity. I gave you three things and they all started with R. I mean, I'm just saying it's a good day. We're going to repent of our hard hearts. We're going to remember the reason for the celebration and we're going to recognize the opportunity. Here's what I've learned. How you view something determines how you approach it. And so if I go into this holiday season, which, which, Sometimes we make the mistake of um, having unfair expectations of people. Like, like I'll tell you this. If, if you go into your 
Christmas lunch expecting to have a fight with your family. Don't be mad when you have a fight with your family. All they did was meet your expectations. Your expectations play a big role because they shape the way you approach things. If you look at your family gatherings, your workplace gatherings, and look at all of these obligations you have this Christmas as obstacles, you're going to consistently try and jump over hurdle after hurdle after hurdle, and you're going to feel exhausted at the end of it. If you would look at it differently, instead of viewing it as an obstacle, would see it as an opportunity to share Jesus with people, you would get to experience fulfillment in this season that maybe you've never had around the Christmas season. And as we look at our lives, the whole reason why you and I exist, if we've said yes to Jesus, well, actually, even if you haven't said yes to Jesus, the reason why you were made was to worship and give glory and honor to God. And now that we've said yes to Jesus, we live our life for that mission, to advance his kingdom, to help people meet Jesus. And so the opportunity we have in this time is really important because what statistics show us is that people are more likely to say yes to an invitation to church and to accept Jesus two times a year, and that is at Christmas and Easter. I'll be honest with you, I've been pastoring for 10 years now. I'll see people who I only see twice a year show up at Christmas and at Easter. We call them Christers. That's what, if you only show up twice, that's what we, that's what, that's what we call you. But here's the thing. Those people showed up and they encountered Jesus. That's the goal. That's why we do this. So we want to create the space for people to encounter Jesus. Statistics show that people, eight out of ten people will say yes to an invite to a Christmas or an Easter experience. You say, I don't believe that statistic. Invite 10 people. Try it out. (laughs) You can prove me wrong. But until you do, you can't say nothing, right? (laughs) We need to recognize that we have an incredible opportunity in this season. In fact, Jesus wants to make sure that the people of his day understood what an incredible opportunity they had. And so as he's delivering this message the Sermon on the Mount, he says this in Matthew chapter 5. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but what good is salt if it's lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. And what I think Jesus is saying here is salt is a few things. One, it's used for seasoning. It's used for flavor. It also has healing properties, when he looks at these people and he says, you are the salt of the earth, he's saying there's a distinct flavor that you bring to the earth that when people encounter you, they get to taste the goodness of God. What good is it if you lose your flavor? You'll never fulfill your intended purpose if you've lost your flavor. That passion you had for the things of God at one point, that's what you were made for. That's what you were designed for. And God wants to keep you in that place where you're utilizing the things he's given you for the purpose of advancing his kingdom. Otherwise, at the end of your life, you'll realize it was wasted or it was worthless. But then he again uses this word, you. You. He says, you are the light of the world. And when we read that, we're like, cool, they are the light of the world. But that's not what Jesus is saying. He's sitting teaching to hundreds of people who are listening to him, and he's looking at them in the eyes, and he's going, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. And they're going, no. You, Jesus, are the light of the world. I'm not the light of the world. You are. Because in their culture, what they've been waiting on is the light of the world to come. And Jesus says, hey, I'm here. I am the light of the world. But if you think that that God's plan has somehow changed and he doesn't want to use people anymore, you don't understand how God works. See, God, from the very beginning of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 2, creates man for the purpose of fulfilling his mission on the world. Before sin ever entered into the picture, God chose to use us. 
And so Jesus is looking at them going, I know I'm the light of the world, but you're carrying my light to the world. You have a role in this. Every single one of us who have said yes to Jesus, Jesus would look at you in the eyes and say, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that can't be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Why? Well, because the basket catches on fire, right? And the second thing is the, the lamp never fulfills its intended purpose. You were made to shine your light. And the reason why is instead a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. You think the world is dark? Did you know that darkness is just the absence of light? If the local church would quit complaining about how dark the world is and would get up and go out, the world would get less dark. We have light. God has given us light to share with people and it is our role and responsibility to step out and share the goodness, the grace, and the mercy of God with other people. And I know what you're thinking. I don't think I can do that. And two of the reasons why people primarily feel like they can't do it, the first one is you feel like you've made too many mistakes in your life and it disqualifies you from being used by God. Can I give you some good news? There's only one perfect person that God ever used and his name was Jesus. If you'll open your Bible, what you'll see is the rest of the people that God used Man, they had issues, like a lot of them. And sometimes we think that these people only had issues before they came to God. No, they had a lot of issues even while they were serving God. Because God doesn't need perfection from you. He needs availability. He doesn't need you to have it all together. God equips those who he's called. He morphs you and I as we stay on the potter's wheel. He doesn't expect you and I to have it all together. He just simply needs us to stay in his process. And if we'll stay in his process, he'll shape and mold us the way he designed us to live. The second reason why many of us feel like we can't be used by God or we can't shine our light is we're like, I have no clue what I'd say to people if I start telling them about Jesus. Moses is in the same boat. God tells Moses, I want you to go to Pharaoh. And Moses says, no. (laughs) I don't know what I'm going to say. And God's response to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 is, who do you think created the mouth? And what God is trying to get at is, Moses, don't you think if I uniquely wired you. Yeah, I know you have a stuttering issue and I know you've got some things that you need to work on, but don't you think the one who gave you a mouth to speak in the first place can give you the words to say in a moment? Most of us just don't want to walk by faith. We're like, well, Lord, if you give me all the things to say on the front end, then I can just go and do it. That's not how faith works. Faith is believing that when you go to have the conversation with somebody, God's going to give you what you need to get through that conversation. Christianity is not about developing a set of lists or questions that you're ready to answer. It's about being open and available so that when God puts someone, puts someone in your path, you're ready to serve them and talk to them and just say what he tells you to say. It's not overly complicated. And when we talk about inviting people to church and we talk about helping people meet Jesus, it doesn't have to be as weird as people make it to be. Can we be honest and say sometimes Christians are the weirdest people in the world? Let me tell you about my Lord and Savior. Like, come on, man, let's just go to Chili's. You know, let's let's hang out. It doesn't have to be that weird. I remember the first time I ever got invited to church. It was a buddy of mine I went to high school with. He came to me and he said, Nick, I want you to go to church with me. I was like, perfect. He said, yeah, but, but just so you know, you're probably not going to like this and you're probably not going to like that and you're probably not going to like this and this and this. You want to go to church with me? No. 
You just told me seven reasons why I'm not going to like it. Don't invite nobody to our church like that. That's not how you do it. You want to know how you do it? You leverage moments in the holiday season. I call it getting teed up. I gave God a promise years ago. I said, God, if you'll tee it up, I'll hit it every time. And so here's what it looks like in, the, in this holiday season. People are going to ask you this question because we in the South and they're courteous. They're going to say, what do you have going on for Christmas? And then you say, hey, you know what? My church is doing some Christmas experiences on the 22nd and the 23rd. I'll go whichever one you want to go to. I, I, you can sit with me. We can even go. I'll buy you dinner. Come on, 20 bucks for somebody's dinner. That's worth them meeting Jesus. And I tell you what, if you'll get in the habit of just inviting people to church, if you'll get in the habit of just sharing what Jesus has done in your life and not making it overly complicated, here's what will happen. You'll start seeing your friends and family members meet Jesus. You'll see somebody that you invited to church come in and they'll raise their hand and I'll give you permission. I'm already two minutes over my clock, but I'm going to keep talking for a second. I hope you ain't in a rush. No, I'm just kidding. I'm going to honor your time, I promise. If they come in, you invited them to church, you know, we do the, the prayer on Sunday mornings, every head bowed, every eye closed. If you brought a friend, I'll give you permission to peek. Because let me tell you, the first time you see one of your friends or your family members raise their hand to say they decided to follow Jesus, you'll never have a problem inviting somebody to church again because you'll get to see a picture of what it looks like to be uniquely involved in God's plan. And you didn't save them, but you played a part in their story. And it makes such a big difference. So what are we gonna do to reclaim joy in this Christmas season? We're gonna repent of our hard hearts. We're gonna remember the reason why we celebrate. And whether it's in your workplace or your family or you're at the gas station, recognize the opportunity because it makes a big difference. As we do those things, we reclaim the joy that God has for us. For some of you, when we talked about having a hard heart, you would say, hey, that's, that's me. I, I have a hard heart. Well, getting rid of that hard heart is not something that we do on our own. It's God who takes our hard heart and puts a brand new heart in us. And so with every head bowed, every eye closed for just a moment, for some of you, you recognize that you need to begin a relationship with Jesus to replace that heart of stone with a heart of flesh. And if that's you today, I wanna create the space for you to do that. So here's what we're gonna do. For just a moment, if you'd say, hey, pastor, that's me. I need to give my life to Jesus. Would you lift your hand and say, it's me. Here's what we're going to do, church. Nobody's going to pray alone. We're all going to pray together. Will you say this with me? Dear Jesus, today I give you my life. I place my hope and trust in you. Thank you for dying in my place so that I could have new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for checking out this week's message. If you made any decisions for Jesus or you need a next step or have a prayer request, let us know by going to www.propel.church hub. That leads you to our digital connect card where you can fill out all of that information as well as see what we have coming up here at Propel. Thank you again for tuning in and we hope to see you again soon.